Hi. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, whatever time it is. Uh, welcome to episode 105 of Left Side of the Isle. I'm your host. My name is Larry Erickson. For about a half an hour or so, I'm going to be ranting away at you, uh, talking about things important to me I think deserve your attention. Uh, any reactions to the show or comments, questions, whatever, uh, should be sent to me directly. The email address is whoviating, W-H-O-V-I-A-T-I-N-G at AOL.com. And since I'm sure you didn't catch that, you can go to my website, Lotus Surviving a Dark Time, and you can get the, web, uh, the uh, email address from there. Uh, I do uh, answer my email. I'm sometimes a little slow about it, so be a little patient, but I do answer it. So, um, all right, with that, we're just going to go ahead and get, get, and get started. I'm actually going to start, in fact, with some updates of things I've talked about before. Last week, I told you about the Cyber Intelligence Sharing and Protection Act, or CISPA, as it's known. Um, CISPA has now passed the House of Representatives. Uh, this is a bill that actually threatens online privacy, and there are a lot of concerns about it, but amendments to the bill to try to address some privacy and civil liberties concerns were either defeated or blocked from even coming to a vote. The bill now goes to the Senate, where last year a very similar bill died, and hopefully that will happen again. Barack Obama has uh, promised to veto the bill in its present form. However, he's made that promise before and chickened out when the time actually came. So let's hope the Senate does its job. Uh, on another update, I told you last week that the French Senate had approved a measure for same-sex marriage in France. Well, it turns out that the French National Assembly has now also passed that bill. So Fran uh, France is going to have same-sex marriage. The marriages could start as soon as mid-July. And uh, related to that, that thing is actually uh, some good news, again, on this front. Last week, New Zealand became the 13th country in the world and the first in the Asia-Pacific region to approve same-sex marriage. The law goes into effect on August 9th, I think it is, or 19th, in fact. There's also some progress on this domestically. Uh, Rhode Island Senate Judiciary Committee has passed its version of the legislation. Uh, in fact, the vote in the state Senate is supposed to be happening as I'm recording this. The state assembly has already passed the bill. So if the Senate passes it, um, and there's apparently a good likelihood that it will, uh, got to do a little bit of minor reconciliation. Then it goes to Governor Lincoln Chafee, who's already said he'll sign it. Meanwhile, the House of, Represent House of Representatives of Delaware has passed a same-sex marriage bill. Uh, it now goes to the state Senate, where a close vote is expected. Minnesota is also debating a same-sex marriage bill, and there uh, a state senator who was thought to be a swing vote on the issue has now come out in favor of it. So there's actually progress being made there. But actually the biggest news on this front, the biggest news this week on this front, comes out of Nevada. Uh, on Monday, April 22nd, the, the state senate voted to repeal a constitutional amendment to the state constitution that bans same-sex marriage and replace it with one which requires recognition of same-sex marriage. Now, that is, I mean, it's only the first step. It just doesn't change the constitution. It's only the first step towards doing it. But the fact is, folks, this is Nevada we're talking about. So we are making progress, at least on that. All right, going from that to something else that I have talked about before, but... Um, a couple of weeks ago, last week, the week before, I, I talked to you about the economic reality that we now face, a reality where the richest 1% of the country got 121% of the economic gains over the last two years because they got all of the gains and the rest of us lost ground. I also said that what the politicos and pundits across both parties, the Democrats, Republicans, the White House, everybody, what they're proposing to do about this is completely wrong. Because what they're proposing is various degrees of austerity, of cutbacks, of reductions, of providing less, of having less. Now, these proposals vary in the degree of the austerity. They vary in how harsh they would be, but they're all about austerity. They're all about having and doing less. And they keep claiming that this is what's going to get the economy going again. That is complete nonsense. It really is. Um, you need to stimulate the economy to get it going again, not detract from it. Uh, in fact, early in his, uh, in his administration, Barack Obama had a stimulus package. Uh, 
But as usual, he chickened out. He offered a package only half as big as was needed, and a lot of which involved tax cuts that weren't going to stimulate anything. Economists predicted that this would be insufficient. Guess what? It was. If you want to stimulate the economy, if you want to get it moving, get it growing, um, you have to stimulate economic activity. You have to stimulate the buying and selling of stuff. If you have something you want to sell, you need people with the money to buy it. If you want to expand the economy, you need more people with the money to buy the goods and services that there are to be bought. You need to stimulate consumer demand. Consumer demand is still by far the biggest engine of our economy. And the only agency in society that can actively create, actively work to create demand is government. And it can do that by taking money from people who have it and aren't using it and giving it to people who don't have it and will. Now, you want to call that redistribution of wealth? Go right ahead. You want to call it soaking the rich? Fine, go right ahead. But it's the fact is, if you want to stimulate the economy, this is what you have to do. You have to get more money uh, moving through the economy, and the way to do that is to get money into the hands of people who don't have it and will use it to spend it on the things that they need. And remember, I told you before, Corporations are making record profits. Corporations have the money to hire people, but they're not doing it. Or to be more exact, they're, they're doing it, but not at nearly enough rate to really affect, the, to bring down unemployment to where it should be. In any event, the point remains that they're not hiring people because there's not enough demand for the work those people would do. Corporations are not going to hire somebody if they're not going to make a profit off that person's labor. So what, what should we do in the short term? What should we do? Bluntly, tax the rich. Tax the rich and use that money to fund social services that, uh, that, that'll go to people in need. Things like Medicare, uh, uh, Medicaid, um, food stamps, TANF, which is what we used to call welfare. Use it to protect the environment, to protect worker safety and protect public safety. Use it for consumer protection. Uh, use it to fund public works jobs in, in infrastructure. Use it to build schools, hospitals, um, transportation. Use it for other projects that will provide uh, construction jobs in the short term, maintenance repair and professional jobs in the long term, and valuable social services throughout. That's what you have to do. Um, and in the longer term, that's what I want to try to get into over the next several weeks. I want to start talking about this more because it's time we faced the hard fact of in the face of increasing concentration of wealth and an increasing concentration of the political power that wealth produces, an increasing concentration of wealth and power in fewer and fewer hands, we have to ask ourselves if is it enough to just stimulate the economy a little bit? Is it enough to tinker with the economy a little bit? Or do we have to face the need to radically restructure that economy and more importantly the way we think about that economy? And yes, that can even involve the dreaded S word. But um, before you rush to reject the idea, you might want to ask yourself where the fear of that idea comes from and who that fear benefits. Because it sure as heck is not most of us. Okay. Um, a bit of uh, sad news this day. Uh, April 22nd, uh, Richie Havens died of a heart attack. He was 72. His career as a folk singer started in Greenwich Village in New York City during the folk revival of the 1960s. His debut album was released in 1967, and more than 40 years and 24 albums later, his last one came out in 2008. He stopped touring in 2012 because of failing health after an earlier um, kidney surgery. But the event that really made his career, the event that people who know him a lot still probably associate him with, was Woodstock the real Woodstock, the original Woodstock, the one in 1969. He was scheduled to go on stage fifth, but because of the massive number of people trying to get to the concert, there were these huge traffic jams, so much so that the scheduled acts wound up being hours late. So he wound up going on first and performed for three hours. So much, so long, that he actually ran out of songs to sing and wound up ad-libbing a variation of an old folk song called I, Sometimes I Feel Like a Motherless Child. 
that variation became known as freedom. Uh, R.I.P. to Richie Havens. All right, more sad news, more down news. It's been a bad week all around. On Wednesday, April 17th, as I'm sure you know, the Senate failed to break a right-wing filibuster on the proposal for expanded background checks on gun sales. The vote was 54 to 46, but it takes 60 votes to break a filibuster. The thing is, this expansion, expansion of background checks, was something that various polls repeatedly showed is supported by an overwhelming majority of Americans, 85%, 90%, 91% in one poll. Vast majorities of Democrats support this. Vast majorities of independents support this. Vast majorities of Republicans support this. Vast majorities of gun-owning households support this. But none of that mattered as long as the NRA, the nutsoid rabbit brains of America, the mouthpiece of the gun industry, said no. I am beyond anger about this. I am beyond outrage. I am right into the realm of cold fury. On a per capita basis, we are the most heavily armed nation on earth. 90 guns for every 100 citizens. Yemen comes in a distant second with 61 guns per 100 citizens. And we are not only the world's largest manufacturer of firearms, we're also the world's largest importer of firearms. In 2011, there were over 6.5 million guns manufactured in the United States and more than 3 million more imported. But that's not enough for the merchants of mayhem and death. They want more. And frankly, they chuckle over the, the blood and the carnage and the gore that their work produces because they figure that all of that will just maybe scare a few more people into buying their own little machine of death and uh, the, the false notion that that may offer them some protection. And what did we hear in the wake of this vote? What did we hear from the liberal media? What we heard was excuses for the Democrats who voted no. Oh, no, 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 no. They're, they're in red states. Uh, they face tough re-election campaigns. What, what else could they do? You know what? I don't give a damn. I don't care. I didn't want to hear it. I don't want anybody to try to tell me that trying to limit the slaughter in our streets is less important than whether or not Max Baucus keeps his job. And that Mary Landrieu can't, can't try to protect the victims of the future, the future Auroras, the future Columbines, the future Newtowns because she's scared the NRA might say something nasty about her. Don't even try to tell me that. Especially don't try to tell me that when all the liberal excuses just blew up in their faces because Max Balk has just announced he's not even running for re-election. The people who voted this down, the people who oppose stronger gun controls, these people are a disgrace and should be regarded as all civilized people as accessories to murder. You people have blood on your hands. As of April 22nd, there have been 3,628 deaths by gun in the United States since Newtown, 25 of them in Massachusetts. And that brings us directly to our outrage of the week. Uh, one of the things is that people uh, talked about that no, no gun legislation could, could pass the Senate. That's not true. It's not true. The, the, the Senate, Congress did pass gun legislation. The day after the extended background check was shot down, the Senate passed a provision that would penalize states and localities that reveal data about gun licenses or gun permits or the locations of gun owners by taking away 5% of the federal funding they get for their local police forces. This passed by 67 to 30. And that's not the only thing that's been done. Oh, no, oh, no, no. Congress, Congress has really been busy. Earlier this year, they made permanent four riders. Riders are things that get attached usually to appropriations bills. They have to be renewed year to year. Well, this year, Congress made four of them permanent. One such permanent provision bars the ATF from shutting down gun stores due to a lack of business activity, which is considered evidence of criminal activity. 
Another bars any federal law or regulation that would require gun retailers to do an inventory of their stock and report that number as, uh, as a way of determining whether guns are being lost or stolen. A third requires the ATF to say that trace, trace reports. A trace data is where the ATF has traced back a gun to, to a crime. Um, and the ATF is now required to say this can't be used to uh, uh, conclude anything about gun violence or about gun-related crime. The reason that's there, it's that kind of trace data that has proved that some federal regulations have been effective in keeping guns out of the hands of criminals. And the other one comes from, uh, it broadens the definition of antique guns and ammunition. Antique guns and ammunition can be imported to the U.S. very easily, and they are not subject to background checks. And this is in addition to renewing riders that essentially prevent the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention from researching gun violence. So yes, Congress has been busy this year, as usual, licking the boots of the merchants of death in their court chesters. And it is an outrage. And we are taking a break. We're back. All right, uh, I'm going to talk more about Boston, more about the Boston bombing. Uh, I'll note at the top that the number of reported injured has risen apparently to like 260. Um, some of those people are injured very seriously, but happily they're all expected to survive so that the number of dead will remain at the low three. All right, so how did what I said last week about Boston stand up against a week's additional knowledge? Well, I got some stuff right and I got some stuff wrong. For one thing, I said that the absence of a clear political motive in the target chosen and the fact that there was no claim of responsibility led me to think this was not international terrorism, so I suggested that it was more likely right-wing terrorism. Obviously, I was wrong. It wasn't foreign terrorism, but it wasn't right-wing terrorism either. Uh, latest reports say that the accused brothers, Tamerlan and Sokar Tsarnaev, were, quoting the, as usual, unnamed U.S. officials, motivated by religion, quote-unquote, or more exactly, their motive was a desire to protect Islam from attack, particularly in the cases of the U.S. wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And those wars, in fact, have been used as a motive for other attacks or attempted attacks by Muslim fundamentalists. The thing is, let's not forget but those wars have produced at least tens of thousands of civilian non-combatant non deaths, including a large number of children. Um, and that a Pentagon report from a few years ago said, and I'm quoting here, Muslims do not hate our freedom, but rather they hate our policies. In other words, the kind of terrorism we've been seeing, the attempts and the attacks are what's classically, classically called blowback, or in a more colloquial sense, what goes around comes around. Uh, and by the way, I need to interject something here. Okay, assuming this is correct, assuming the talk about the motive is correct, uh, we should not say that they were motivated by religion. When right-wing Christians in this country blow up abortion clinics or, uh, or, or kill uh, staff, we don't normally refer to them as right-wing Christians or as Christian terrorists. In fact, we usually don't mention their religion at all. We just, and we describe their motive as anti-abortion or as particularly bizarre in this context, pro-life. And we especially don't refer to their religion as their motivation for what they did. If they, we don't do it there, we shouldn't do it here. All right, anyway, getting back to what I said last week. Uh, I, w I was right about something, at least I, I meant to say, I think I did say, that whatever ideology actually drove the attack, that it would turn out to be the work of one or two or three people. It would be essentially a lone wolf attack. Uh, that, uh, the point is this wasn't part of some larger international or domestic plot, uh, which again, if current reports prove to be true, uh, I was right. Officials are saying that uh, the brothers are not connected, that as far as anybody knows, they're not connected to any larger group. And I was right, unfortunately, about a third thing. 
I said I hoped it was a right-wing attack because right-wing attacks don't seem to have the same impact on our civil liberties and our privacy uh, as those from other causes and sources. Already, the attack is being used by the right-wing in just that way. Um, the, uh, 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 let me give you an example. Let me give you an example before I go on. The, boss, uh, the Obama Justice Department decided to delay giving Tsokar Tsarnaev uh, a Miranda warning that he could remain silent under the public safety exception that the Supreme Court carved out of the Fourth Amendment in, back in 1984, this was. The public safety exception gives the police the authority to question somebody they arrest briefly about things that might be uh, a question of public safety before they tell them that they can remain silent. Briefly has never been exactly defined, but it's generally been held to be no more than about 48 hours. And that's what they did. But that, of course, was not enough for the reactionaries. So we had a collection of right-wing bozos, Senator Lindsey Graham, John McCain, and Kelly Ayotte, and Representative Peter Bagman for the IRA King, demanding that Sarnia be treated as an enemy combatant because we do not want this suspect to remain silent. Another gopper, Senator Saxby Chambliss, and, uh, echoed the idea. These people didn't actually say how they were going to make sure that he didn't remain silent. Perhaps they figured that New York State Senator Greg Ball did it for him when he tweeted on Friday, who wouldn't use torture on this punk? So in other words, they want Sarniev, who was a naturalized American citizen who was arrested on American soil for acts committed inside the U.S. and has no known connection to any outside group to be stripped of his rights, labeled an enemy combatant and perhaps tortured. Constitution? What constitution? Now, to its credit, however, and credit where it's due, the Obama administration resisted the demands of the right wing. Sarniev has now been read his rights and he's going to be tried in a civilian court. But still, that has not prevented the right wing from trying to take advantage of this on another front to ramp up xenophobia, fear of foreigners, and using the occasion to try to derail immigration reform. Now, there are multiple examples of this, but the real action was in the Senate. The Judiciary Committee is holding hearings on a proposed immigration reform bill, and the right wing is to try to slow this down or stop it altogether. And the Judiciary Committee, uh, committee Senator um, Chucklehead Grassley, declared that, yes, the Boston bombings are, in fact, relevant to immigration legislation because, quoting him, if these two individuals used our immigration system to assist their attacks, it's important to our ongoing discussion. Now, recall that Zokar Tsarnaev came to the United States with his family 10 years ago at the age of nine to seek asylum from the violence in Dagestan and Chechnya. Grassley also objected to the uh, statement by committee chair Pat Leahy that the bombings uh, shouldn't be used, quote, to derail the dreams and futures of millions of hardworking people. Grassley fumed that he didn't accuse anyone of using the Norristown killings as an excuse for gun control and that no one's being criticized to pointing to the fertilizer plant explosion in Texas uh, in, in order to push for more safety inspections. Well, you twit, maybe that's because there actually is a connection between gun control and Newtown and between safety inspections and the blowing up of a fertilizer plant. Grassley later exploded himself uh, when Senator Chuck Schumer said that some are using the Boston bombings as an excuse to delay or kill an immigration bill. I never said that, he literally shouted at Schumer. Schumer said he didn't mean Grassley, he meant unnamed others, but frankly, a more honest and more responsive answer would have been, yes, you did. You didn't use those words, but yes, that's what you said. So, a mixed bag on my predictions. But uh, there's something else I wanted to talk about. The, uh, that's the media coverage of the bombing, the media coverage. I said last week that for the right wing, the only possible source was Muslim terrorism. But frankly, it wasn't just the right wing. Much of the media, while holding up a facade of impartiality, actually displayed an astonishing bias. And again, this is, this is important. This is before any facts were actually known. Um, for example, on MSNBC, we had Martin Bashir uh, talking to Robert Cressy, who's a former White House counterterrorism analyst. Uh, Bashir began by talking about Chechen terrorism, based entirely on the fact that the brothers are from the region. Cressy pushed back, saying, I'm reluctant to call this Chechen terrorism because 
We don't know. Uh, Bashir kept pushing. What was Tamerlan Sarniyev doing when he went to Russia in 2010? Haven't people gone abroad, gotten training, and then come here to commit terrorism? Who did Tamerlan Sarniyev talk to in Russia who may have led to the bombing? Kresti kept saying, we don't know enough to draw any conclusions. Finally, Bashir gave up and turned immediately to foreign correspondent Richard Engel. And despite all that his expert, Kresti, had just told him, Bashir went on about Chechnya and about how Chechen terrorists are particularly bad people. Engel happily went along with the hints that the Boston bombing was either a Chechen or, and or an Al-Qaeda operation, and the two of them spent eight and a half minutes on TV in fear-mongering and innuendo. Then there was an, uh, uh, NPR, which had a story on its website about homegrown terrorists. Not, of course, about the Timothy McVeighs and so on. No, it was about, uh, quoting, extremists who grow up in America and can fly below the radar of law enforcement. It then went on to name the brothers and said, quoting, they're exactly the kind of recruits that international terrorist groups such as Al-Qaeda are looking for. They didn't even bother with the pro forma acknowledgement that there's no known connection between the brothers and any larger groups. And the New York Times did its part. First three paragraphs of a story on April, for, uh, April 21st. I'm going to read these very quickly, but I'm going to read them in full. With one suspect dead and the other captured or lying grievously wounded in a hospital, the investigation to the Boston Marathon bombings turned on Saturday to questions about the men's motives to the significance of an overseas trip one of them took last year. Investigators are hurrying to view a visit that uh, one of the bombers made to Chechnya and Dagestan. Uh, predominantly Muslim republics, both have active mil uh, militant separatist movements. Members of Congress expressed concern about uh, ex exploring the man's possible links to extremist groups. Um, well, all right. The point is, this are the first three paragraphs. Five paragraphs later, the article gets to saying this. The brothers' motives are still unclear. So after spending the first three paragraphs going on about the overseas trip to Chechnya and Dagestan, how those are Muslim republics with active militant separatist movements, and about Tamerlane Sarnev's possible terrorist connections, and how his sojourn might have marked a crucial step on the path to the bombing, in the eighth paragraph, it gets around to saying, we don't know the motive and there's no known connection to outside groups. That is how our paper of record covered this. That is what the media was doing. All right, I'm going to end this up very quickly with one thing to lighten things up a little bit. This is our hero award. It's given as the occasion arises for people who simply do the right thing. Cameron Lyle is a senior at the University of New Hampshire who had been competing in track and field and hoped to compete in the shot put at uh, the American East Championships. He won't. On April 24th, he's going to be in the hospital donating bone marrow to a complete stranger. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, it turned out that he's a perfect match for this person. So he had a choice between finishing his college career or um, going to save someone's life. He said it was a no-brainer. The recipient, who by law must remain anonymous for at least a year, is a 28-year-old man suffering from acute lymphoblastic leukemia. He was, he was supposed to die in about six months. This may give him a few years. Cameron Lyle, thank you for making this week a little brighter than what other ha otherwise have been. That's it for us. So let me just tell you, this is the beginning of the third year. This is our second anniversary show. This is the beginning of the third year of Left Side of the Aisle. Your comments and questions are welcome. We will see you next week.